In this video, we're going to create a new project in Android Studio, and we're going to walk through a series of screens that set up our project, and we're going to see how those relate to our project. In other words, what effect do those have on our build file and on our project itself? We'll consider things like dependencies, applications, and versions. So we start by opening Android Studio, and I have an existing project started here, but no problem. I'm simply going to say New Project. And it gives us several things that we can select from here. Basic activity and has the, the little plus in the circle, which indicates a floating action button. A floating action button is something that sits on a separate virtual layer from the rest of your screen and can be on top of the rest of your screen. Then we have empty activity, which just doesn't have anything. And uh, bottom nav activity, that's nice if you have a tablet view or something and you want to be able to navigate across the tablet. Fragment and view model, which is the one that we're going to choose because we're going to do an MVVM or model view view model design pattern. Full screen activity, um, master detail flow, nav drawer is pretty popular, a Google Maps activity, login activity, scrolling activity, tabbed activity, and then native C++. One thing I'll encourage you to do is think very carefully about what you want your first screen to be. Don't make it a main menu because that puts everything at the same priority and requires that the user make an extra click to get into whatever they want to do. Also avoid a splash screen unless it actually has a purpose of getting something ready in the background, but in general think if there's a better way to do that same activity without a splash screen. Also avoid a login screen. If you're designing your app don't make a login screen the very first thing that the users see. Why not? Number one, you'll spend a lot of time writing a login screen, and there are a lot of times I've seen group projects get stuck at that phase and never get to their core architecture. Work on your core capabilities first before you worry about login. Also, we can use a third-party login provider like Firebase Authentication, and it will deal with login and password resets and all of that, which is less work that you have to deal with, so avoid that login. Now, from the user's perspective, login means I have to do something. I have to make myself not anonymous before I may proceed. Think about all the things that your app can do with the user being anonymous. Users want to go in and try things out without having to log in first. So think about having maybe an anonymous view where they can view publicly available data, like restaurant ratings, for example, and then a private view where they can alter or modify data, like adding a review. And then let the user go in and see all the anonymous data, and then once they try to go into that unanonymous zone where they're going to change data, then have them log in at that point. So we're going to do the fragment and view model. We'll go ahead and select this. Uh, one thing I'll say is my screen has a kind of funny resolution here, so I'm going to just take it aside and hit next. And now from here, what are we going to call it? We're going to call it My Plant Diary. Now careful on the package name. Package name should be unique. Uh, so a lot of times what we will do is we will do our domain name in reverse. We'll do something like edu.uc, but then uc.edu, my name is not unique within that, or sorry, that is not unique unless we consider my name. So let's use my Bearcat ID, my 6 plus 2, which is unique to me within the edu.uc domain. Uh, and then we can say something like my plant diary. So this is going to create the packages for our application similar to what we saw here in Argo UML where you see I have a package name on the top and then a series of classes that are inside of it. Now here I had com.myplantdiary, but we'll use what I created here, edu.uc.jonesbr.myplantdiary. If I were following this diagram exactly, I'd make it com.myplantdiary. Language is Kotlin. Minimum API level uh, this says users have to be on this API level or greater to use my application. I'm setting it to Android Pie, which at the time of this recording is fairly small. So if we were doing a production app, we might want to go back to Marshmallow. But for this class, we're going to be looking at things that are uh, newer in Pie and in Android Q. So we'll go ahead and keep it as a minimum of Android Pie. And uh, use Android X artifacts. That's good. Uh, let's go ahead and choose Finish. You see it's opened a new window and it's creating and building our app as, as we speak. I'm going to double shift. Double shift says find this file anywhere and it's one of the nicer things that we have in Android Studio. I'm going to look for build.gradle 
And there are two different build dot gradles. There's kind of like a system level build dot gradle in this uh, in this dot location, and then there's also what we'll call a module level build dot gradle within app. So let's go to build dot gradle, and we see this just has a couple of high level things. It's not too common that we access this build dot gradle all the way at the high end. Uh, let's go ahead and take a look at build dot gradle in the app module. That's the one we're going to see a little bit more. So we take a look at this one and it, up at the top we see it's plugging in a few Kotlin Android extensions. Now we get to this Android open curly and you see it's kind of a JSON-like syntax. Not exactly JSON but fairly similar. You see compile SDK version, minimum SDK version, and target SDK version. So minimum means this is the, you have to have at least this SDK version on your device or greater, 28 being Pi. Compile and target means, well, we're shooting for 29, which is Q. Now, application ID is very important. You see, that's that package name. If you remember when I was entering in edu.uc.jonesbr.myplantdiary, reason why the package name is important that's our unique identifier on the Google Play Store. So let's search for Plant Places, which I released back in 2013. So it's a live app on the Play Store. Take a look up at the top here. Do you see that the ID is com.plantplaces? And that takes us to this screen here. And this is essentially our app store. Now, if I switch that to Plant Flashcards and only change that, change nothing else, take a look and it's going to take us to Plant Flashcards which is a different uh, application that I have created. So that application ID is important because it's our unique identifier to the Google Play Store. One reason why that's very important is all of our ratings and reviews are tied to this application ID. So if we happen to release an application that gets a lot of bad reviews, we don't have a whole lot of opportunity there except to start with a brand new application ID to get rid of those old reviews. So lesson learned, but then that actually gets rid of all of your application history as well. So lesson learned here, we want to start with our best foot forward. We don't want to release an app that does not have the quality that our customers are going to expect and deserve. So unique identifier there. And one nice thing about releasing onto the Google Play Store is you get this console view that shows you your apps the active installations, and the rating for your app. So once again, you notice plantplaces.com mobile has this unique identifier of com.plantplaces, where plant flashcards has com.plantflashcards. Now, one time I refactored and I, and I mistakenly changed that application ID on plant flashcards, and I published it without knowing, so it came up with this unusual com.com.plantflashcards.com. You don't want something complex like that. Make it something simple. Let's go ahead and jump into Plant Places Mobile. And you see the dashboard will tell us a whole lot about our app, how many users have we acquired, how many users have we lost. It can also give us some statistics on what application version they're using and what Android version they're using so that we can tune our application for our users and we can get a good understanding of what our users are using. So a whole lot of really nice features here that we'll get to take a look at as we see how to deploy our application. But all of that starts with the wizard that we started with when we were creating our project. Now you see version code and version name here. Those are important as well because those have to be unique every time we deploy to the Play Store. We see for Plant Places Mobile, it's currently on version 19.1. Uh, there are a couple versions I had to skip for one reason or another, but we can go back and we can look at a history of all the versions that have been released. So that version's important, but also think about do you ever want to buy version 1.0 of software? Probably not. So be good with that version naming and numbering and give it a version that your users are going to want to download. So we've looked at the application ID, the min SDK version, the target SDK version, the version code, and the version name in the Google Play Store. Next thing we want to consider are dependencies. Back down to our apps build.gradle and we'll take a look and see these dependencies that have come in for us. So. There's several handy dependencies that we have. We have some lifecycle extensions and the like, kind of some boilerplate dependencies, and then JUnit and also Android X. So Android X is exciting. It uh, coincides with Android Jetpack, and it makes support libraries a whole lot easier to maintain and handle. 
We will probably spend a lot of time in this dependencies section this semester because anytime we need to go add some external library, maybe retrofit, uh, maybe dagger or butter knife or anything else like that, we'll come into this dependency section and we'll add it here. So this is a file we're going to get used to. Let's take a look at our project and just get an understanding of what's there. We see that we have a top level app. Oh, sorry. Notice first I'm on the Android view, uh, which you can select from this drop down. That is the default view. And it's the view that uh, is probably the easiest to use with our Android project. So first we have manifest and we have Android manifest. This file describes our application. And actually this file has gotten a bit smaller and even a bit less important than it used to be. This has things like our package name and it has any permissions that we need, uh, other things like that. Also any place where we want to write a file, we have to define it in here first. But a lot of things that used to be in this Android manifest are now actually in the build.gradle. So our uh, application ID and our version used to be in the manifest, but they moved to the build Gradle. So you see, this is a bit of a smaller file, but it's still one that we're going to occasionally go in and edit. It's a file that's simply describing our application. Now under Java, you'll see these are our compiled classes. And you see three kind of directories or packages here that look very similar. So ed.uc.jonesbr.myplantdiary. Hopefully that rings a bell because that's the package name that we put in when we started this application. But why do we have three of them? Well, the top one is where we put any of our classes, anything that we're going to work with. So you kind of see the blue and orange K here, which indicates Kotlin. And this is our main fragment, our main view model, and our main activity, which was created for us when we chose on that very early screen that we wanted a fragment with view model. It created this infrastructure for us, and now we can go in here and we can make more edits. Now, under Android test and under test, we have a couple of different things. We have an example unit test. This is a plain old Java unit test that doesn't know a whole lot about the Android operating system. It's a, it's a unit test. It's something that can be run to test our programs. It has a series of assert statements where we start with an expected and then we go with an actual. Uh, we can right click and choose run. It'll build and run this and hopefully it will tell us that four is indeed two plus two. So that's what the example unit test is. Now the example instrumented test is very similar, but has one difference and that is it can know about the Android context, which is describing the app itself. So if there's a test that you need to write that needs to know about the application, it goes to this example instrumented test. Generated Java, don't worry so much about. Uh, that's naturally going to be generated, so uh, something that's going to happen under the covers. Res, you see drawable. This is where we're going to put things like images. We use a lot of images in our app, and it's generally a good idea. Why is that? Android's design guidelines say images are faster than words because people can recognize images in much less time than it takes to read a word. Additionally, think about internationalization. Your audience might not speak the same language that you do. So to make things easier, use universally recognized symbols instead of a lot of text that maybe you understand better than somebody else. Layout. This is where we will put our screens, and our screens are essentially XML-based. By the way, as I'm speaking, uh, it's running our test right now. You see it took a couple minutes, and you see that it did verify that our test did pass, that indeed 2 plus 2 does equal 4, so it gave us a little green check. So I let that run as I kept explaining, but you see, nonetheless, it did finish up. So back to layout now. For layout, you'll typically see layouts come in pairs. There's a layout for the activity, and then there's a layout for the fragment as well. So an activity is kind of like a grand owner, and then it can swap out fragments underneath. Uh, there are other ways that you can do this. You can do it just with an activity and no fragment. Several different options that you can choose. Uh, MPI map, just a few uh, launcher images. In other words, that's the image that the user will see uh, on the home screen. And then values is handy. Values has things like strings so that we can easily change languages. So this is, a, this is a series of English language strings. We can have French, Spanish, so on and so forth. And that way we can provide alternate translations for the text that a user will see in our application. Colors. These are the colors of the app. 
One of the things we're going to do this semester is we're going to use a color wheel to pick some colors that are specific to our app. Styles simply tells us a little bit about the look and feel that we're going to use for our application. And we can use, we can add other files under here as well, like we will add a file paths file when we want to save an image to the directory. So that's a look at our application. One more thing that I'm going to do now that I've started my application is I'm going to commit it to Git and I'm going to push it to GitHub. So for that, I go to VCS, and I'm going to say import into version control, share project on GitHub. Now I have already authenticated here, so it knows who I am. Um, I'm going to simply say my plant diary queue. Now, if you, haven't if you haven't already authenticated, it will likely pull up a few prompts here and ask you to log into GitHub, but we'll go ahead and say my plant diary queue. Remote origin? That's just a nickname for this essentially GitHub instance. If you see git pull and then a name origin, it's just saying origin is identifying which remote repository you're using. I can name it whatever I want. We'll keep it as origin. I'll hit share now. It'll take a few moments to create this. Now it's going to ask me to add all these files to git. Yeah, we'll go ahead and say initial commit and we'll choose add. And it says successfully shared. Let's go ahead and click the link and see where we go. And sure enough, here's my plant diary queue with one commit. So now my project is available in GitHub. Uh, this semester we'll use GitHub quite a bit. Essentially every major thing that we do is going to be a separate GitHub branch. And then we'll merge those branches into our master branch over time. But that'll make each lesson kind of nice and bite-sized. So if this video has been helpful, I look forward to reading your comments. Thank you.